So, uh, welcome to lecture 5 of MCS 507, a course on mathematical, statistical, and scientific software. And this lecture is about SymPy, SciPy, and integration. Uh, so, integration is here kind of meant in a double sense. Uh, I use integration from calculus, but I also use integration in the sense that the purpose of this lecture is that I want to show how uh, everything is integrated quite well. Um, so, uh, especially in the sense for integration, where we have numerical integration as available in SciPy and symbolic integration as available in SymPy. And we will see how both symbolic and scientific approaches, numerical approaches to integration uh, can collaborate here. Uh, this uh, course is also suitable, uh, is also suited for students with other than Python programming experience. If you are coming from another environment, if your programming language was Java or if you implement it in something else, then this would also be a good course for you. Um, so there are exercises that are very basic programming exercises. So, and the learning of Python also happens by looking at mathematical problems. So that's why integration uh, is again a, a very good uh, subject. Um, all right, um, so numerical integration is an important topic in numerical analysis. In this course, we are not uh, going into numerical techniques. Uh, it's mainly important that we can locate uh, the good numerical libraries. Um, so how do we integrate? Uh, well, we want to approximate the area under the function. So here we have a function f and over between uh, a and b, the area is approximated by the area of the trapezium. Um, and here we have then an explicit formula. So that's the idea, the main idea behind the trapezoidal rule. Let's see how we can code this up. Uh, so everything here is prepared uh, for interactive command line uh, operations and combined with the script. Um, so there will be also a Jupyter notebook that uh, also then combines both the interactive computations and the using of functions, longer pieces of code, uh, in um, in in a code cell of a notebook. Okay, so to begin with, how do we define functions? Well, we can define function as one line. So we define a function t with the keyword lambda. The function t for trapezoidal rule takes on input another function and the two endpoints a and b. So the formula for the trapezoidal rule is translated into, into a function. Uh, if I want to test this on the exponential, then I have to import the exponential and I pass the exponential as the first argument. So that's a very short uh, definition uh, with a lambda one line definition. Uh, we can also define functions uh, the long way uh, when, and that's particularly very useful when the functions get or needed when the functions get longer. So we have the three arguments and then we have the documentation string. Note the nice feature of the dynamic typing. It's only when we're going to use the first argument, so fun here, that we are going to use that we 
that the first argument has to be a function. Okay, um, there are scripts that are posted. Uh, so here uh, we have the longer uh, complete program, if you like, where there is a sub function, a subroutine, the trapezoidal rule, and then there is a main function uh, where we prompt the user for the endpoints. Um, and then we print uh, all the information in scientific notation. So what gets printed, the endpoints are printed with one decimal after the dot. The uh, approximations are printed with the full uh, precision. 15 decimals um, after the dot. So with the exponential, uh, the exponential is a, a very good test function because the symbolic antiderivative of the exponential is again the exponential. Another way of saying that the derivative of the exponential is again the exponential. So from a programmer's perspective, we can compute the error by simply computing the exact value by the application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that is done in the last two lines here of the code. Okay, uh, so running this at the command prompt um, is typing in uh, Python or Python 3 if you have multiple versions. Uh, so we ex uh, run the program so there is a message being printed we enter the bounds the program confirms uh, that we are integrating over the given bounds so you see the bounds are now written in scientific notation and then we have the approximation where you see that if we look at the numbers we see that only actually the, the we have only have two decimal places correct or perhaps three if we would a little bit not be so careful so we only have two decimal places correct so the trapezoidal rule is actually not such a good rule when applied just as we did here on a very large interval um, so there was the uh, function um, so we also have the branching so we can define um, if else statement with a conditional with a one line if else statement um, so this is illustrated here again so we had this also in the last lecture in lecture 4 this is to avoid uh, the exceptions uh, so the Python has an, a, a very elaborative exception mechanism. The alternative to doing this explicit test would be to provide an exception handler inside your function. So we may get to this when, uh, when exception handling is really critical when you define uh, a user interface. Uh, so especially with web interfaces where the input can come from everywhere and where you don't want that your website somehow crashes when the user provides wrong inputs. So we're going to get to exception handling there. Um, uh, so there's also the, not a number. Uh, so if you like, you can be a little bit uh, more um, sophisticated when the user provides a, a, a bound that is out of range then you can define not a number which also means undefined in this way here so that's a virtue of the um, numpy package that not a number is uh, well defined here um, okay let's go back to the integration problem um, so um, we want, say, a more accurate uh, approximation for the integral than what the trapezoidal rule can give us. Then the way to work would be to work with refinements of the interval. 
so to use more than one interval here we are subdividing the interval and the nice thing about this is that we actually now could compute two approximations we have the one from the big interval and then the one from the smaller uh, from from the two intervals another way of seeing this is that uh, we could yes so that's 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 what we are going to do now i don't want to run ahead of time so uh, we start with our first approximation and then we so that's the first statement that is executed here uh, that was the plain uh, trapezoidal rule then we compute the middle of the interval and uh, perhaps I should have uh, come back so uh, the way to see this formula is that uh, you can see that the next uh, value is the perhaps I should say this again I'm sorry I'm confused now so the the next uh, approximation if you have the middle point is the previous approximation divided by 2 so the dividing by 2 happens because the size of the intervals gets divided by 2 so all the function evaluations that we took get lesser weight uh, we give the we have then a new point that we use and we give the weighting is then the length of the interval which is here the left and the right divided by two so uh, we have a more approximate we have a more accurate result because we are using three function values but we also have an error uh, an estimate for the error um, so what I want to illustrate here is that we have functions that return tuples so the return is a tuple with the approximation and the error estimate um, so functions correspond to the notion of mathematical function but we have already seen that with passing references we can have functions that uh, have side effects and now we actually can also have functions that return multiple values all right here is the main script again um, so the beginning of this lecture is still very much defined as in working in the context of compiled languages where you would have one entire program that you run except here the compilation and the eventual linking stage is all merged into the repeat evaluate and print the repl loop the REPL loop um, that happens now instruction by instruction so here you see now that um, i compute the approximation and now my error estimate tells that I have three decimal places or almost four decimal places correct. So the 9 times 10 to the power minus 4 indicates that, well, if you only look at the minus 4, then you would think of four decimal places. But the 9 is coming in front of that. So actually it's 3 decimal places and you can compare this so the 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 error estimate it is an estimate so it's fine if you don't know the exact value to say we focus on the minus four here which tells you that we have four decimal places correct okay and we compare with the exact value and we see that this error estimate is okay um, so I'm trying also to kind of summarize, if you took a course in numerical analysis, you, you, you may be familiar with the scientific notation and also with the concept of error estimates. Um, uh, we will be not writing our own numerical software. We will be using numerical software, but it is important that we can interpret the results. 
uh, so good numerical integrators and we will see one uh, will also return error estimates okay so then we have the composite trapezoidal rule um, so we divided already the interval once in two equal parts we can compete on, we can continue doing this um, so that's the composite quadrature rule where we have equidistant uh, subintervals and where we apply the trapezoidal rule to every subinterval. In the formula, we are being careful not to reevaluate twice. Um, so here you see the rewriting of this composite trapezoidal rule, where we have uh, the explicit formula. Okay, and, and now you can also see last lecture we had on vectorization. So you can, this big sigma here, we can evaluate uh, within a Python for loop, but we can also use the vectorization now. So the function that we integrate, we can vectorize it. So numerical integration is another application for the vectorization that we have seen in last lecture. Okay, uh, so that's the purpose of the exercise. Um, so the exercises one and two are basic programming exercises. Uh, if you have already a lot of experience with Python, then they may be very too, too low below your level. Um, but the vectorization may still be new. Uh, so exercise two, is uh, a way to to reinforce what we have done uh, last time. And you can also time uh, the execution again. So you can define one version, uh, one function, and then with time it, um, you can uh, test the performance of the vectorized version versus the plain elaboration of the uh, f uh, version of the first exercise. It, it might even be worthwhile to consider we have an explicit loop for i in range and then you accumulate the sum. But in Python we also have list comprehensions. So you may also be curious, list comprehensions, they are shorter. And then we have the sum method on that. So you can actually write the um, composite trapezoidal rule. You can almost define it in one line and also actually use the lambda for that. Uh, so the, if you are interested in really short uh, code, then Python helps you with this. So the question could also see to make uh, exercise one a little bit more interesting. Uh, do list comprehensions, the shorter more compact notation does that also pay pay off um, if you have to do uh, the the numerical integration it definitely pays off if you have to make a list of functions uh, if, if you have to make your list and then add this up so you could also say that it's not going to be more efficient because with a list comprehension you make the list of all values and that's not going to be efficient if you only need one number. So, so even, even exercise one leads to some very interesting questions. Um, okay, uh, that was Python. Uh, so let's now uh, look at SymPy. Um, so SymPy is a computer algebra package that is standing on its own. Um, uh, it's also integrated in SageMath. So if you SageMath is um, also is actually more than a computer algebra system, but primarily it's one can be seeing it as a, as a computer algebra system. Uh, so SymPy is good if you want to extend uh, Python without going to 
a very huge uh, software system such as Sage. Um, um, there are comparisons. Um, installation is often a problem. If you just want to try it, uh, you can also do this in a, in, in a Sage cell server or in CoCalc. Um, there are short introductions. Uh, so this introduction might not be um, the, the, the best one. So I have only one reference here. But a short introduction uh, is already given here. And I give the references for completeness. Uh, the, the purpose of the lectures are also that it gives you a quick starter uh, on how to work with uh, packages. All right, uh, here is an application of uh, SymPy. Uh, we, want to comp we want to make our own integration rules. Uh, so we compute, we approximate, we compute an approximation for a definite integral with a weighted evaluation, with a weighted sum of function evaluations. So the question is, how should you determine the weights? Um, so in this rule here, so this is a symbolic uh, formulation with A and B, I have already determined that I want to do my function evaluations at the end and at the middle. And we know already how to do this. So you could say that, hey, why do you do this? Uh, we've seen just the trapezoidal rule, uh, where you split your interval at once. But wait, uh, we, we can do this better. Uh, we have three parameters. And we can actually make a rule such that every quadratic polynomial, every polynomial of degree 2 and less, will be integrated correctly. Um, so, in, in some sense, with, with numerical computations, you always expect some errors. But here, if your functions are quadratic or linear or constant, then you will have an exact result, exact up to machine precision. Okay. Okay. So let's let's see how to do this, uh, and let's see how to do this completely symbolic. Um, so symbolic computation by definition is computing with symbols it's also computing how you would do it by hand um, so here are the requirements uh, the integral operator is a linear operator so the integral of a linear combination is a linear combination of the integrals so what are we integrating we are integrating the basis functions 1x x squared if the basis functions are integrated exactly, then also every linear combination will be integrated exactly. Because what, is, what does our integration rule do? Our quadrature rule, it combines the function evaluations. It's just a linear combination. Okay, so we have three unknowns. We have three parameters, or actually two parameters, A and B. So... Uh, we can set up the linear system. So uh, the linear system is defined by the conditions on the quadrature rule. So the right-hand side here on these equations, um, as they are formulated, are actually the applications of the quadrature rule. We apply the quadrature rule to the constant, which is just the sum of the weights, and that has to equal the length of the interval. That's one condition on the weights. Then we integrate x and uh, we apply the quadrature rule to it. And then we apply the quadrature rule to x squared. So we have a symbolic uh, system. Um, now where the SymPy come in, we can solve this. Uh, so actually, if you look at it, I'm rambling a little bit too long here. Uh, as you're looking at it, you can probably do this by hand. But there's no need to. Here is we can uh, formulate uh, this problem entirely symbolic. 
Um, so in working with symbols, you have to declare your symbols. Uh, so we import var. Uh, so the a, b, the two parameters, and the three weights, the unknown weights, they're all symbols. So I'm declaring a sequence of symbols at the left. So they will be called a, b, w, a, w, m, w, b. And they are objects to SymPy. SymPy can work with them. Um, so we can define our rule then completely symbolically. Uh, if we have any function that we can evaluate at those symbols, this is our rule. I will also use a symbolic function. So I will have a function, capital F, to which I will apply my rule to. Um, so that's here for the purpose of uh, printing out. So there is the symbolic integration, and that's the integrate. Um, so you see from SymPy, I import integrate. So I have the rule, the rule that is applied to the basis functions, b0, b1, b2. So the x here is used twice. I have the little x, which is the local variable in the basis functions. And then I have the capital X, which is the global variable in the session. So the big X is just the placeholder in the integration, in the integral, in the symbolic integral. So you see how the definite integrals are evaluated. I have my function in x, and then I have a triple. I have the independent variable, the capital X, and then the integration bounds, which are my two parameters. Okay, uh, so here it is. So, uh, we will solve three equations. Uh, the equations are printed just to make sure that uh, it makes sense to us. And then SymPy has a very good operation solve. And I will import uh, solve with also two other uh, functions that I will use later on. And I will solve the three equations with the parameters in there. So I have to say to SymPy what the symbols are that are of interest. I'm interested in the weights. So you see at the very bottom line, I have the solution expressed as a dictionary. So a dictionary in Python, remember, so this looks like a set. So it's a set of keys. The keys are the unknowns, the unknown weights in my rule, the values, so what comes after the column, are the values. So I have the, 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 the values um, that will be the values for the weight. So that's the symbolic output. How do we use this now? Well, I have my rule uh, that is applied to a generic function, capital F, so any function. So what I do is I substitute, so subs is substituting. Um, subs with a capital S is, um, how should I say this? So it's it's a symbolic uh, function. So it's a, it's, it's a function that also stores the data. So it's the function that is applied, the substitution is applied, but symbolically. So which actually means that's just a placeholder. So in, in some sense you can use rules or functions also to store data. And then at the, at the right occasion, you actually do it. You, you, you evaluate. Uh, the substitution. Um, so this is kind of delaying. So here it's no delay because I have to do it immediately after the capital subs. Uh, but also think about, for example, Taylor expansions. 
where you compute as many terms as you need. So that's also a way, so series are another important tool that we have from symbolic computation. So you can compute as many series as you want. Um, and that's also a way of gradually uh, adding more and more accuracy to your computations. Okay, so um, we use the factor uh, to uh, neatly display uh, the formula. And here I'm giving already it away. It's actually the Simpson integration formula. If you took a course, perhaps you might even have seen this in calculus uh, or, or but certainly in numerical analysis. Um, so, but here we're focusing on the uh, symbolics. So we can turn the formula into a rule that we can use numerically with the lambda phi. So I have the rule formulated as the capital F. So the formula, full and capitalized letters, is uh, the formula that is still symbolic, not very useful just to look at. But then with the lambda phi, we turn a formula into a function. So a function depending on the capital F, which is just a placeholder for any function, and the two parameters, the left and the right bound. And then we can verify this. Uh, so this is set up uh, in, uh, so and it's good to simplify as well. Um, so, ex uh, so symbolic computing uh, has the uh, sometimes, uh, so with numerical computing, you have to worry about round off. With symbolic computation, you may get expressions different expressions for the same thing. So that's why I've used the factor. So the factor is already one way to normalize. Simplify is another way to normalize. Uh, so normalization is a process, a canonical, uh, a very standard process into symbolic computation to resolve uh, the uh, fact that sometimes you may have multiple expressions for the same thing. All right, here is the output. Uh, you see the output of the um, Simpson rule. So this is the formula, symbolically with the bounds in there and the symbolic function. Then you have uh, the rule as it is applied. Um, so I have an approximate value and I have an exact value. You see how the... Um, 1 over 3 shows up. Um, so if I run this um, symbolically, then I get the uh, exact value, but the error is actually 0. So if I use the, 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 the exact rule. Um, so, and you recognize, uh, you can compare s at the very bottom is the nicely typeset Simpson rule. So we have the b minus a divided by 6. Um, so you see the b minus a divided by 6 is actually the common factor. So it's still written as minus uh, a minus b between these round brackets and then the division by 6. Okay, so this is smeared out out of several slides. Uh, for me, it, it, it's good it's one way to explain several ways on how you work with SymPy, uh, illustrated on a useful calculation in the making. The, it's called the method of undetermined coefficients, which we use in numerical analysis to derive uh, numerical integration rules. So it's also a way to illustrate how symbolic computation generates formulas for numerical use. So in, in, in programming, there is also the term code generation, where uh, code is actually not written by hand, by humans typing things, but is generated 
by other programs, starting from rules. Uh, in, in a way, this is also, in a way, generating a function, generating a numerical code. All right. Um, so that was actually the center part. Um, so the, the the way I presented here on the slides uh, was by dissecting a Python script that is posted. There will also be a Jupyter notebook that contains the details of the narrative. Um, step more, or or that 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 will contain. Uh, the entire code that you can look at. Uh, you can also split it out and in several cell blocks and run this step by step, piece by piece. So first the, 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 the part where you formulate the equations, then where you solve them, and then when you interpret the result, get your numerical integration. Okay, um, so the, in the third part of this lecture, I go back uh, to designing functions. Uh, so in a way, um, functions uh, have often a lot of parameters. Um, so here uh, is uh, one example. Uh, when we do numerical differentiation, we make uh, we use what is called forward differences. Uh, so, if we are running the forward differences, we can say that 10 to the power minus 6 is a good default value. You see the, the, the derivative of the sine is the cosine, and the cosine at 0 is 1. You see here, as a numerical approximation, this looks quite good, 0 0.9999999. But we can play uh, with this. So, if we want, so if we do not give any arguments, then we the h the step size is 10 to the power minus 6 we can give it a larger value 10 to the power minus 4 or a smaller value 10 to the power minus 10 turns out that 10 to the power minus 10 is actually quite good it gives us the exact value okay um but so far so good so that was numerical differentiation um, that's an entire subject on its own um, how should you actually really be doing uh, numerical integration um, there is the uh, software written in Fortran um, so in, in, in a way if you are familiar with Fortran very good if not, uh, you can still benefit from a lot of great libraries. Um, so there is the Quadpack library. So this is dating from a very long while back. Uh, it's a public domain uh, library and it contains a lot of rules, but most importantly for us uh, who are often in a hurry and we want to just have a value, uh, it retains uh, a very uh, nice um, black box integrator. It also contains Romberg integration. Um, so in a numerical analysis course, we, we, we saw Romberg integration, uh, but we called it as up ourselves because we wanted uh, to understand what Romberg integration is. So Romberg integration helps in uh, making the trapezoidal rule, sometimes the trapezoidal rule is really, really slow, especially on uh, integrals like this here. This is the sine function with the damping. So there might be a lot of oscillation in this. Uh, we now have that Romberg also in, so it, it, it was actually a problem. Uh, what is the uh, correct in, in, in numerical analysis? what is actually now the number of uh, steps that you should take. Now, the, the Romberg from SciPy Integrate actually takes care of that. Uh, so here you see uh, the number of function evaluations that it does. It's also efficiently implemented. Uh, so the key point here is uh, the number of function evaluations that you do. 
Uh, let's compare this to the Simpson rule. So we derived the Simpson rule, but actually there is a Simpson rule. And the Simpson rule is vectorized. Uh, that's also the, the point that I want to make here. Uh, you provide uh, the Simpson rule with actually a list of function evaluations. Um, so I just computed this with Romberg. And uh, you can see from the previous slide, it's actually not so good. So this is what Romberg uh, returned to me from the... Uh, Build-in, uh, so it may be good to remember the two, three, six, four, nine from the four or last four digits, and you see that we don't actually get there. Uh, perhaps we should have looked at the the first four digits. You see that here actually the Simpson rule uh, agrees. Uh, so that's another way of looking at um, how many function evaluations sh should you take while well, you double the number of function evaluations in every step. And you compare the decimal, the number of decimal places that agree. So in some sense, this is an iterative method as well. And this method applies uh, the exponent and the sine function imported from the SciPy li uh, library. So they are vectorized. Um, Okay, uh, one last uh, argument. Um, so, um, we have um, uh, touched on, when, when, when I try to explain object-oriented programming, you can have one method that applies, we had the draw method, that could apply to a point, to... Um, to a line, to a parabola. So that was the lecture on object-oriented programming. But you can also have this kind of flexibility with functions, uh, where you have functions that apply to objects that can be of variable length. So sometimes you want to compute, so here the example, the very simplest example, is the area computation. So if you provide only one argument, then the function will assume that it is a square. If you apply this with two arguments, then we have a rectangle. Um, so there are optional arguments, and the optional arguments are given by a tuple. And they're always coming to the end. Um, so here is the Python syntax for this. Here is the example. Um, so you can check on the second argument, which is the width. Uh, for a rectangle, we have the length of the triangle and the width. Uh, a square has only one parameter, the length. Um, so the star is here kind of used uh, in both ways. So we have the star in the argument of the function and then we have the star the multiplication notice that if you are using a tuple a tuple is a composite data type so that's why we had the uh, square bracket not zero in there so we are selecting the first argument okay so we have optional arguments uh, that are tuples but then we also have keyword arguments. Uh, I mean, you, you, you may have felt already a little bit uneasy uh, with uh, implementing area, whether you give one argument or whether you give two arguments. What if the user just doesn't know this of your function and was just uh, forgetting the width? Uh, so then that's not right. So if you r really want to have an extra argument there, you have to provide it with a keyword. Um, so keyword arguments are used frequently. So in, in, in a way, this is very particular to functions. So we are not working in the object-oriented way. But we, we are... This also applies to when you have to define the methods in your classes. Um, especially when it comes, and also it's it's kind of um, you you kind of see when you are using uh, the Kinter, uh, where with the canvas you have so many options, the background color, the the, the, the dimensions. Uh, why these 
many many arguments are actually uh, keyword arguments so keyword arguments are stored in a dictionary uh, and they come after the optional arguments uh, so you have the regular argument then the optional arguments and then the diction the, 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 the keyword arguments and when you define a function um, here is the example again so somehow this is the simplest example that I could come up with it's not much of an example uh, you can now also test on whether your dictionary is empty or not if your if there is a keyword argument you can also test in this uh, so for every keyword and here I'm actually not saying what the keyword is I'm actually using for each inwit so each inwit is each is just a, a variable name um, I'm actually multiplying with every uh, key the corresponding value so each perhaps it, it, the word key for each key in the dictionary called width I'm taking the value and taking the product the nice thing here is that um, if you are dealing with rectangles then you have to explicitly indicate what is the length and what is the width um, so here we are making just a product. The order of the operations doesn't really matter. Um, so, uh, but it could be that you are working with where with a function where the arguments they have to be supplied in a very particular way. Uh, so, especially when you have many many uh, arguments, you there might be extremely bad things happening when you interchange uh, the arguments um, so and I'm and I'm now thinking again in designing numerical uh, routines so you may have tolerances which are very small numbers so 10 to the power minus 6 we had as a default tolerance but you may also have the number of iterations so the number of iterations can be 10, can be 100. Typically, this is an integer number. Um, you can handle this with strong typing. So in Julia, you can provide typing. And also, I've seen in the latest versions of Python. One way to deal with this is also to deal with keyword arguments, where if you're using the step size, you specifically have to use the letter H or step whatever you want to enforce and the number of iterations either n or specifically iterations okay so uh, these are things that you need to know if you are designing your own functions but most importantly when you use software uh, you need to be aware of that there are keyword arguments that you need to provide Okay, um, you can explicitly test on this. Uh, so uh, here is an alternative uh, definition with the each. Uh, so if uh, the if there is a keyword argument, then you can actually really test that the keyword argument has to be with. Uh, so you can really test whether the user has uh, provided the correct uh, parameter name. Um, so Python is very, very flexible. Uh, so you can, there is dynamic typing. Uh, the interpreter will guess the correct type. But as a provider of function libraries, you can build in all kinds of checks. Uh, that really is going to check whether uh, a correct uh, formal parameter name has been applied when you call the function. Uh, further checks would be to really check on the type of the argument. Uh, if an integer was expected, that an integer is given. Um, all right, so here is the main program again. Uh, so this uh, lecture was designed from within the mindset of writing some very small programs. As you may have learned, 
programming, your first programming class. Uh, this also can be seen as uh, within the Jupyter Notebook, as I hope to be able to post on the course website. Um, Okay, so there are some additional exercises. Uh, so the, so the, the, the main point is uh, there is a SciPy, um, which provides uh, additionally, um, other than linear algebra, there is numerical integration. There are also other packages. So we will have a lecture on solving ordinary differential equations because this is so important for mathematical modeling. Um, the exercises here uh, are additional programming exercises to the purpose of these first two weeks is still that you get a little bit familiar with working with Python. Um, and these exercises are meant for this. Um, so. Uh, we've seen SymPy as well, um, so you can use SymPy to construct more integrate, more uh, accurate integration rules of higher algebraic degree. Okay, I hope that the use case of integration uh, combined with some extra features of how functions work um optional arguments keyword arguments i hope that this gives a good introduction of what python uh can do for you um, and i'm running over time again so i stop this recording